let's talk a little bit about the different light sources that we use in our interiors, starting with daylight. And I think uh, I've made it pretty clear that I really think daylighting is the way to go for a lot of different reasons. One of the biggest is really just the physiology of humans. It's, it's a more natural light for us to see things under, but it also affects our circadian rhythm and our moods. Um, so it's really important to try to include it when possible in your projects and when appropriate, of course. So first of all, one thing to consider is the site orientation of your project. First of all, there are different degrees, different angles that the sun is in the sky. It doesn't just sit still. So each of these orientations has an advantage or disadvantage based on the prevalence of the sun at different angles. So for example, a southern exposure, you might think, well, don't you get a lot of light? The sun is in the south. Um, well, yes, it is, but the southern exposure when you're on the inside of the building can mean, among other things, problems with fading of interior materials. And that's because that south facing light, the light that is coming in from the south of the building can be the most intense. You get the sharpest shadows, the most potential for glare, the most ultraviolet radiation. So it can really be intense and actually a little bit difficult to control that light for any activity that involves kind of visual acuity. Northern exposure, on the other hand, is when you have windows or skylights on the north side of the building. And for that type of lighting, it's actually generally much more even. Um, the spectrographic characteristics are that it's a little cooler in temperature, but it's also great for things like painting studios, and other spaces where natural colors are very important, but you want to have greater control of the light. East and west exposure are generally good, but the problem is that the angle of the sun gets very low. So the sun has a low angle during the morning when you're on the east side of a building, and but the rest of the day it's fine. The same is true for the west side of the building in the evening, you get that low sun angle, it can be very difficult to control full of glare. So again, you'll want to think about what sorts of spaces occur in those areas. If it's your breakfast nook, do you want that glaring sunlight in there? Well, you might appreciate a lot of natural light, but the glare could be an issue if you're not controlling it. So first of all, what is sunlight versus daylight? Well, one thing to consider the the sort of standard is that sunlight is direct sun without clouds and daylighting is either diffused direct sunlight or it is uh, just a cloudy day and certain areas of the country as you can see here are a little gray i went to graduate school in Oregon. It rains a lot in Oregon, basically every day for about seven months out of the year. So daylighting is great in Oregon. In fact, it doesn't even get all that cold in the part I was in. However, if you are craving sunlight for one uh, use or another, say an atrium that is, you're hoping to grow something in, that could be a real problem. So the other thing to consider when you're choosing between how to treat uh, windows, which are on the side of a building, and skylights, which are typically on the top, although you can have things like transom lights, which are kind of a combination of both, is uh, what kind of lighting conditions you're going to have. Is it going to be primarily an overcast area or is it going to be a sunlit sky? when you the main consideration here is just kind of looking at your adjacent uh, building conditions and also studying the light conditions in the region that your project is in interior designers generally do not have a lot of control over window location but they can and often do specify skylight location now the other thing to consider is a little bit of a, a highly conceptual thing here which is the notion that the sun actually doesn't always follow the same path in the sky. That in fact, and, and we know this kind of instinctively, the days are shorter in December, but the sun angle is also much lower. So in the morning, the sun angle is very low to the sky no matter what time of year, but the 
the direction that it's coming from is different. So in our level of the, our latitude on the Earth, here in the Northern Hemisphere in Massachusetts, the angle of the sun in the middle of the summer in June is quite far to the north. And those of us who have to drive to work early in the morning, you realize that if you're driving to work at 530, the sun's going to be right in your eyes if you're basically driving almost north. Whereas in January in good old, or December 21st in New England, if you're driving kind of south by southwest, you're going to have the sun in your eyes. Now, a lot of these things you, you don't have a lot of control of because they're architectural elements, but by using the elements of a building, projecting elements, you can actually try to control the penetration of sunlight into a building. This is a, a common technique, uh, particularly in regions of the country where it's hot. You might want daylighting, but you don't want that heat gain and the other, the glare and the material deterioration. So by creating an overhang that is de designed geometrically to block the light in the middle of the summer, you prevent that heat gain and the sort of high summer, bright, powerful light. But in the middle of the winter, you allow that sunlight in. This is great when you're using passive solar to warm your project. Now, other things to consider are how you space out the building program. So for example, as mentioned, the breakfast nook, does it go on the east or the west or the north or the south? And there are many answers to these problems, not just one. The other thing is controlling the window aperture itself. And by this, uh, I mean that the shape of the sort of interior face of the window can be adjusted. You, you can't always control the size, shape, or location of the exterior window, but you, you can fiddle around with that interior shape. And you can, if you're working with an architect who is designing the overall building, you can say, hey, give me a funny shaped window with a strange sculpture standing next to it. Or if you're Tadao Ando, give me some unusual skylighting conditions. And of course, he played with the view outside the window, as well as the lighting conditions that you get from the window. The other thing that you can do is you can try to integrate daylighting with electric lighting. And this is a great way to save energy in particular, and also have a more even light level in a space which relies heavily on electric and day, or which relies both on electric and daylighting. So here's a space, an atrium space, obviously lots of windows, some high, some low. They have integrated a number of things, including uplighting, and that occurs at different locations, but also downlighting and a light shelf. Each of these is meant to kind of complement each other. I could imagine this space looking quite different during the day and the night, but still retaining some of its high proportion and kind of more, I don't know, grandiose configuration. Uh, and the way this works, if you look at this diagram, there's basically what's called offset dimming. And where with that situation, you have banks of lights which are switched separately so that the ones by the window can be shut off. In fact, with some fixtures, they allow you to shut off one lamp inside the luminaire and not the other. Again, just trying to reduce the electric light output in the space. If these are windows, these lights may need to be on, but if it's daylight conditions, these can probably be off. These might have one on and one off. Anyway, you can also organize your building such that the ceilings themselves help to reflect light. This building here, they've used the different uh, types of daylighting, side lighting, which is windows on the side of the building, and skylighting to get different light distributions. Again, they're trying to get a light condition in the space that is comfortable and well suited for the use. These can all be calculated, by the way. Anyway, this space uses integration with HVAC systems. Again, they've got daylighting, but it's been broken up by this, essentially a light shelf that's also a duct. And that allows local control by the window to keep glare down for students trying to do work. But it also reflects light deeper in the space. Even the ceiling acts as a reflector because it's angled. 
And there are many, many strategies, only a few of which we can touch on and, of course, that we can do as interior designers. But some of the easiest ones are things like light shelves and light pipes, light wells, things that bring daylight deeper into a building. It's those deep interior spaces that are the ones that often are the most problematic. So in this case, here's some light shelves that are just reflecting light into a space. And very frequently, you want to have a lot of daylight in the space. Just it's cheap. It's there all day long and it's natural. This is a library. And so you also want people to have a sense of the passing of the day. Uh, and even in a residential setting, uh, these are light pipes. It's basically a light duct. And I've used these, they're actually very nice, particularly in a renovation addition type of arrangement. Often an existing bathroom will have its window sealed off. This is a great way to bring that natural light where we appeal, our skin appearance is much more normal. We can now bring daylighting into that space which has been cut off from the outside. These uh, light pipes have a slight variation. This is actually at a convention center in Austin, Texas, bright area. They have used a, a skylight, but using it to backlight a sort of frosted glass material. Again, the nice thing about it, it's a feature wall, it's interesting, and it also gives you a slight sense of the passing of the day, even clouds going overhead might have an effect. And Skylighting, often it's just a money-saving a money saving approach. This is Costco on the right here. They just want to save money on electricity. It's not, not, nothing simpler than that. The products at Costco are not shown off in any fancy way with electric lighting that is bold and interesting and unusual. It's a cheapo place, and so they, they use skylighting to just save on their electric bill. It's pretty simple. Uh, but you can also use it to create kind of interesting shapes and lighting conditions up in the ceiling, they can, they can be more of a point of interest. And with daylighting, there are so many different ways to control daylighting. None of them are, of course, perfect because daylighting is very powerful and also very changeable. So let's look at a few things. The biggest thing we're worried about here are things like veiling reflections. Look at that old iPhone. Wow, I gotta change that image. Anyway, veiling reflections are the things that have to do with brightness on the screens. Glass screens and plastic screens respond differently. So you really wanna try and control glare at the window either through the placement of the programmatic elements so that they're in a position which is not in a glary spot or by, um, by controlling light at the, at the source. The simplest thing is to glue some junk onto the window. There are these window films. You can actually follow the link to 3M, has all sorts of different stuff. But the ones that are probably most suited for us are shading devices. And they can be varied in their translucency, in how they operate up, down, down, up. And the ones that um, can be adjusted to start in the middle and go down or start in the middle and go up. So there are all sorts of different things, even shutters. The ones we have in our classroom are Lutron's Savoia, which is a nice uh, automated electric system. You just press a button. They can have presets. They can even be integrated with daylighting. And they have fun switch plates. Gotta love those fun switch plates. Anyway, there are so many options. And frankly, because of the color and power of the light at those exterior windows, this is something I really feel needs to be addressed in almost every project. And, and sadly, it's often something we just either leave out or do a half half, uh, you know, what an effort in Photoshop to try and make it work. But, but really, these are powerful things. I mean, even varying the translucency or to use a pattern at the window, these can be really, really interesting. And you can combine translucent materials with opaque materials to get a number of different conditions. You know, even the coloration of the material this can be an opportunity for a real pop of color because, as we now know, the color rendering of natural lighting is just so much better. It really, it really makes those colors pop. So 
Anyway, you can also use it as a pattern creating device. This is a very strange bedroom on the white right, but it uses a horizontal, almost black wood slat to create really a very powerful pattern in the space. Not quite sure what's going on with the window placement. May have something to do with what's going on in the exterior, but obviously you're, you're not going to put a bureau on that wall. Anyway, uh, this has been used to affect in historical buildings. This is the section through the Lou Kahn building in Fort Worth, Texas, the Kimball Art Museum, um, which is very nice. It has kind of a scooping daylight. Daylight is, of course, best for lighting colored pieces of art because most of them are produced under daylighting conditions. So there's also something called the daylight factor, which if you've ever wondered why do older buildings always kind of look like a letter of the alphabet? Well, it has to do with this daylight factor. Two and a half H, which is H is the height of the window, is kind of the depth into a building that you can get reasonable amount of daylighting. And what that forces you to do is basically have wings of the building that are kind of limited to, in this diagram, roughly 45 feet. And then you end up, if you want a bigger building, you just have to kind of add more letters of the alphabet on to the plan. So, but you can do it in other ways. This is Alvar Alto's Mount Angel Library. Alto was famous for these sort of dramatic section uh, gestures. Hidden up in that giant black mass is kind of all the, the HVAC and sprinklers and all that kind of junk. But he has designed them to be essentially giant daylight reflectors. He's calculated the reflecting characteristics of the light coming in through that outer window. And you can see there's even baffles on that outer window. And again, just the, the experience of this interior space is of even lighting that gently changes during the day. It's really a very wonderful space. Another example is good old Tadao Ando, and he called it his, this church, the Church of Light. So you can, you can bet that it's going to have something good for us. And it does. It has a very interesting kind of dramatic symbolic use of the uh, cross-shaped uh, light pattern, daylight pattern. Obviously, it's a Christian church, so they use a cross. Um, but then he also has these gentle daylighting conditions. You see how even at the top of the space, there's a little bit of light sneaking above that wall. And just a very gentle use of the space um, and can be quite dramatic. Of course, at night, what does this space look like? Well, it's going to look pretty different. So anyway, there are a number of terms that we can, we can discuss with daylighting. Uh, the biggest one is seasonal affective disorder, which is that problem in winter where people essentially get depressed. And it's a, it's a mood disorder, which is diagnosable and also treatable to a certain extent. So, and you can calculate how much you can save by using things like these active lighting controls, these offset dimming. Um, you can just plug in the numbers when you add uh, when you add this sort of control system to your building. It's of course much more expensive to add in a building control system in advance, but these building control systems for anything other than a residential application are really actually very becoming much more common and are a great way for facilities people to monitor the building. So let's talk about electric lighting and some of the different sources that are out there. Now, there are major families that uh, we're going to look at. First of all, incandescent is the most traditional one. It's basically burning a filament. Tungsten halogen is a flavor of incandescent. And then there's a, a, a bunch of discharge and HID and LED uh, types of lights. And, and these are, there's so many different flavors of each type. But in particular, it's worth noting that at this stage of the game, most lighting that we're going to be using kind of moving forward is going to be LED. The discharge lamps are high output and very energy efficient. They have a competitive advantage somewhat over LED, but even for their most traditional use, which is to say gymnasiums and street lighting, that you're starting to see LEDs replace them there. Incandescent are essentially going out, going away because they're just so energy inefficient and we are 
heating up the globe so fast with all our all our uh, power plants that that they need they need to go. So let's take a look at the different characteristics of, of each. First of all, the light output, how the light comes out of the lamp is really the, an important thing because that's how we make our architectural effects in a space. Then there's something called efficacy, which is to say how much light do you get out of a source per watt? And that's measured in lumens per watt. Then there's the color of the light itself and the CRI and the color temperature, which are different. And then lamp life, which is worth considering. A lamp which is super efficient but uh, and might last for 25,000 hours, but when you go to dispose of it, it needs the EPA to come in to control the chemist chemicals. That, that probably is not so great, or at least it's worth considering. So let's take a look at a couple of things. First of all, just a diagram uh, from the book that shows that one compact fluorescent equals whatever it is, a dozen incandescence and so you really do need to consider this particularly in projects where you have facilities issues if you think of the atrium space that we have way up at the top of the atrium space they used to have these little halogen track lights that as far as i could tell did nothing else except burn out every thousand hours which because they're left on all day long in that bright atrium space they had to change it basically every year. And to do that, they had to pull the astragal off the door and drive a cherry picker into the space. So you'll probably want to consider using a longer lasting light source than that. So you can also consider heat load when you're choosing lighting. Although as mentioned, because we're basically using LED luminaires from here on in, the heat load is, is not going to be as variable as it would be if you were choosing between, say, incandescent and fluorescent. And so how does an incandescent lamp work? Well, basically, there's some pretty simple parts. It's basically a, a bulb, a glass bulb, which contains either a complete vacuum or more typically something like nitrogen or argon gas or halogen gas. And then there's a filament, which is typically made of tungsten and is the bit that burns. And there's two wires that lead up to it that are called lead wires, and there's often little support wires in there too. And these come in so many different shapes. There are just a, a million different shapes that we can, we can choose from and sizes and even base types that you can choose from. Again, these are historical. These have been around since the 1870s, so there's been plenty of time to develop this particular technology. Um, just as a fun fact, there are three-way lamps have actually two filaments. There's one filament that has the lowest wattage. There's a second filament with, say, a higher wattage, 100 watts. And then the third filament is at 150. There you go. Tell your friends and family. The main kind of incandescent lamp that we use is the omnidirectional type of lamp. This is an A lamp. A stands for arbitrary. And the other way that you specify, the other part of the specification is 19, A19. 19. 19 stands for 19 eighths of an inch. So your standard lamp is an A19 lamp with a medium base. Now, there are other flavors of incandescent. The most common one is one that we've used in class, the directional one. This is a reflector incandescent lamp, R lamp, and it improves efficacy because you get lighting in one direction, so you're getting a lot more light power, a lot more lumens going in the direction you want. So you can use a lower wattage lamp. Um, they are also available in what's called a PAR configuration. And this is what we commonly term like floodlights that you put in your backyard. Although flood actually describes the light distribution and not the shape of the lamp. So a PAR lamp is that kind of metallic one. There's also something called an elliptical reflector, uh, which is common sometimes in like French fry counter, frankly, is the, the most common one. MR lamps are halogen lamps with a special kind of multifaceted reflector. The reflector often appears kind of purple. These are used in stores a lot, partly because they look cool, but partly because the special reflector allows 
uh, infrared and ultraviolet light to go through the reflector so it doesn't bounce off the reflector and hit whatever you're lighting. And this is great if you're worried about clothing color uh, depreciation. You can use an MR lamp to help preserve those colors. So the book shows a couple of different light distributions from these different sources. And the main idea is that the R lamp, the reflector lamp, doesn't have quite as precise control as the PAR lamp, P-A-R. And again, it's just the sort of geometry working for you that the, gives the PAR lamp much greater control. It's got a smaller filament, and it's got a more precisely designed reflector. And uh, these in, in sort of enlarged detail, um, the, the, the way you can tell them apart, well, one, the PAR lamp it w just weighs a lot. They're heavy, whereas an R lamp is a lot lighter. Also, the R lamps are typically, in, just regular incandescent PAR lamps are typically uh, halogen, which has a smaller filament and is therefore easier to control. So they can be bought in any number of beam spreads. They are not adjustable like a flashlight. So you can get spot, which is can be very narrow spot all the way to wide floods. That's what these codes stand for. So an SP10 in the order code typically means a 10 degree spot. These are becoming better in the LED world. We just uh, haven't quite caught up yet, but I believe that LEDs are going to be just, just as good and then have all the LED advantages. So tungsten halogen lamps, which we keep talking about, are, are a kind of form of incandescent which are somewhat more efficacious than regular incandescent. And it's just due to this halogen effect where the filament kind of burns a little bit hotter. It burns at about 500 degrees. And the atoms on the filament somehow kind of redeposit back onto the, um, the filament. I don't know why that is. It's some, some chemistry that's going on there. Anyway, all of these different lamps can be purchased with different types of base. A wedge base that you might see in Christmas lights, a prong base, a screw base that you might see in a headlight. The main thing that you're going for if you were to specify different bases is, again, in the old days when there were so many different types of lamps, you wanted a little more control over who, what sort of lamp is replaced. Purchasing the wrong lamp it was sort of the bane of uh, uh, custodial departments for years and years. Anyway, they and sometimes they get very, very funny or they are funny looking or they were meant to go in very precise locations. For example, a PAR 64 was a very kind of wide, flat lamp that you would use for lighting the facades of buildings just because you often had to kind of sneak it in on some kind of crown molding uh, on the front of the building. 64 refers to the eight di diameter. It's eighths of an inch. So that is an eight inch diameter lamp. They're, they're, they're big. Uh, anyway, fluorescent tubes are a whole nother family. And uh, basically those work in a different way. You're not really burning directly any object. What you're doing is you're making an arc of electricity cross between two electrical contacts. Uh, and what happens is the, the electricity, when you, when you up the voltage enough, the electricity just can't take it more anymore. It has to jump from one uh, anode to the other anode. And that sort of lightning bolt inside the tube hits the, the junk inside the tube. And that's, this is usually mercury, other inert gases, rare gases, and then phosphorus. Phosphorus is the big one. It glows. It really uh, is what the light source is all about. And uh, in fact, phosphorus occurs in washing, clothes washing soap when you want your whitest whites. The reason they're white is because they actually glow just a little bit. But anyway, it's probably an environmental nightmare such as life. Anyway, fluorescent uh, tubes you're probably familiar with. There's many different kinds, including the circline, which we have in class, the U-shaped ones, which were very common in some of the older buildings on campus, and then the linear ones, which come in two and four and f six feet or eight feet. Um, compact fluorescents are very similar. They're basically the tube kind of bent into a little funny shape to fit into any number of different situations. 
Uh, HID lamps are still occasionally used for things like parking lots or, uh, again, Best Buy. I always pick on them. They have slightly lower color rendition, but uh, Metal Halide is the flavor that is the one that really is, is kind of the most commonly used. It has the best color rendering. It's probably as good as a decent fluorescent lamp. Uh, the, they do have a funny thing, which if you've ever noticed, like a street light kind of cycling on and off, it takes time for them to turn on. You can't just flip the switch. Even fluorescents have this problem of it takes them 20, 30 seconds sometimes to come to full power. The Some of them, like metal halides, can take three or four minutes, which is why if the power goes out at a baseball game, it does take some time when the power comes back on for the lights to come up to power. So let's talk about solid state lighting. Now this is basically all LED all the day and uh, LED work in kind of an entirely different way. As mentioned, they're, they're basically kind of a wafer. Typically it's an aluminum plate with a kind of heat sink on it. And the LED piece is the bit that is glowing. And often there's like a, a thin wafer of phosphor or other horrible chemicals on top of it. And then often there's a lens on top of that and an, and an acrylic spread lens on top of that. And how does it work? Well, I don't really know. There's something about two plates, an N and a P metal plate. It's all very much a physics experiment. But the idea is that elect electrons can't take it. They have to jump from one plate to the other, kind of like a fluorescent tube and light is emitted in the process. Now, what we will see in our sort of world is often just a kind of little lump of plastic with a yellow bit on the inside. And, and we have seen that in class. Again, there's often just this little square. Sometimes it will be covered by a variety of devices. Now, these LEDs all need what's called a driver, and it's a little electrical device. It is more complex than things like a fluorescent ballast, which is just there to jump up the voltage. In this case, this controls both the voltage, but also it can control things like the color of the light. If you have an LED that is one that can have its color adjusted, like the one, the flat panel we have in class, the driver is the thing that makes it happen. And also, of course, the physics of the chip. Now, one thing to consider is LED light sources, as mentioned, are not omnidirectional. They are sort of unidirectional. They basically can only emit directly out of that yellow piece. For the most part, that means that you're going to get uh, kind of 30 degrees in either direction off of the, the kind of center line of that light source. And that's why we've seen so many different kinds of bulbs that enclose these LEDs in the kind of craziest manner because they're trying to, trying to recreate this omnidirectional effect. Um, and the, these are just, they're just trying to replace incandescent lamps. They're not trying to do anything new. Uh, some of these are just, it, it, I can't believe, you know, that they came up with these. Um, so we really do have to think about when we have uh, a project where we are re-lamping, where we're not replacing luminaires, we're just putting in new lamps, then we need to consider, are we going to get the light distribution out of this light source that we want? And more often than not, we are not when we're going to use LEDs. So I like the small lamps as mentioned in class, but some of them are, are kind of doing some real backflips to try and get that omnidirectional effect. Again, you're, the best thing to do is buy the lamp and plug it in and see what happens. Now, unidirectional light sources, ones that have a focal uh, length or a focal uh, arrangement, those work better with LEDs. You just have all the LEDs facing in the same direction. And often these will have um, different spread lenses to help you arrange them. Now, even fluorescent tubes can be replaced with LEDs. And as mentioned, the advantage of these is that, first of all, there's a large built uh, uh, system of LED troughers in most 
projects. You can reflect the light off of internal reflectors very easily. So these do have a big advantage uh, for brightness in a space and reducing veiling reflections. They're not always the most beautiful fixtures to look at. LEDs also have flexibility and I think this is one of the more fun kind of architectural uses for them is you can you can just get a ribbon of these little emitters these are the little ones we saw earlier kind of wrapped in plastic so that they are protected and these can be essentially glued up just about anywhere uh, they do have a certain degree of complication in that the driver needs to be matched to the number of LEDs that are on these things. But again, it's just a calculation. So what we tend to see in our kind of ready-made luminaire world, the ones you just buy out of a catalog, is that the fixture has the LED integrated into it. There's no bulb to screw in, it's just integrated. And this is allows a really thin fixture. You can sneak those LEDs and the, the kind of wafer thin chip that they are glued onto into a many different situations where a regular in incandescent or even compact fluorescent lamp wouldn't work. And you can use that to your advantage. I like this one because the heat sink is kind of cool looking. It's kind of fan shaped. But Anyway, the biggest advantages are they can be made in almost any incandescent bulb shape if you want to replace them. They have gotten really cheap. An incandescent lamp might be 25 cents a pop, but I have seen replacement LED lamps for less than a dollar each. So really, given how much longer they last, typically uh, we are seeing about 20,000 hours. You're, you're going to save a lot of money because for every one incandescent lamp, you're going to, or for every one LED, you're going to need about 25 incandescent. So you're also getting a, a lot of lumens per watt. Um, do be aware that not all LEDs are dimmable. Again, it's the circuitry that's inside them. Purchasing the ones that are dimmable and color changing, for example, the ones available at the Apple store, the Hue, Philips Hue, those are much more expensive than ones that are fixed light output. So there are some other more rare types, um, OLEDs. You may have heard of these from fancy schmancy television sets. There's stuff like cold cathode and neon, which are also used in architectural settings and are very similar to um, each other. And they have very long life. Neon, I forget, lasts something in the 50,000 hour range, even longer. Fiber optics is another one. The fiber optic piece itself is not the light source. Usually there's some kind of metal halide light source or high output LED as the light source and it shoots light through the, the glass fibers and the light comes out the end. So how do you buy a light bulb? Well, nowadays it has gotten a lot more complicated. In the old days, you'd just buy a 100 watt bulb or a 50 watt bulb or whatever it is that you wanted. Now you see all these very confusing things on a box. Uh, uses only 43 watts, but it's 60 watt replacement. But how, what, how do we know what's going on? What kind of light output? What we need to look at now is the number of lumens. They always put the number of lumens on the light source. That's how much light energy you're getting out of the, the lamp in total. You also do, this is, these are halogen bulbs. You want to consider lamp life, but as long as you're using LEDs exclusively, they're all going to have a very similar lamp life. So again, this one, it has all this brown color, I don't know why, but it's still, it's just less, less light, less light coming out of the lamp. A uh, few of these others, again, the, very confusing here. How many watts is this thing? 75 watt equivalent is 20 watts. What does that even tell us? Look at the light output and uh, be aware that a 100 watt lamp, an old incandescent 100 watt lamp, is about 1500 lumens. So that's about as bright as you're going to want for a screw-in type of lamp. A lot of these you have to you have to kind of hunt around. This says it's a 60 watt replacement, it says in big letters it's only 9 watts. Again, look at the lumen value, the light output. You will note by the way that good old Revit and some of our other software does use or you can specify a lumen value for light output in some of the fixtures if it's set up that way. Anyway, 
again, they'll they'll try and do a little razzle dazzle to tell you, oh my gosh, you can save a dollar twenty per year. What? How do you even know that? Well, those things can be calculated, but just look at the lumen output. You also want to take a look at whether or not it can be dimmed, and uh, if the color temperature is going to be what is going to work in your situation with LED. Color rendering, we're getting 85 to 90 is, is, is the typical range that you see nowadays. They're pretty good. They, things look pretty, pretty nice. However, the color temperature is hugely variable. This is a 6,500 degree Kelvin color, and that is a bright, white, cool color temperature um, that is going to feel very uncomfortable in your desk lamp. Okay, also the light output is 2800 lumens, which is like a 150 watt uh, lamp. So again, just be aware that uh, the color temperature is very important. So to kind of sum up the all of lighting history in one slide, not all of lighting history, but as much as we're covering uh, the traditional incandescent, the one uh, at the left here, approximately 1600 lumens is what you're going to get out of a 100 watt lamp. I said 1500. I guess I stand corrected. Lifespan, about 750 hours when this slide was made a couple years ago. It's about 37 cents per bulb. Now, you go to halogen, you, it's more expensive, lasts a little longer. It has other features such as greater optical control, but basically you're still burning stuff. So I like the little wasted energy diagram. You're, you're still wasting energy anytime you turn on a light, but that's a whole nother matter. Compact fluorescent was an interstitial technology. It, it, it was more expensive, but it lasted much, much longer. So over 10 years, you might save a lot of money because even though you, you have to spend $2.23 a bulb, you would have to buy a dozen of these. The It ends up being cheaper mathematically. Now, this one, you can tell this is quite, actually quite an old slide now that I think about it. $45 per bulb. That's no longer true. We're, again, we're looking at probably a dollar to $2, maybe three if you're looking for one which is dimmable. Um, for the same 1600 lumens, now you're only spending 20 watts instead of a hundred. So if you imagine a building like our art center with maybe a hundred or 500 bulbs in it, if you can save that much, you are saving, you know, thousands of watts, a kilowatt hour every, every hour of the day. So there are quite a few different terms which we need and which I kind of went over or at least mentioned as I was zipping through the lecture. So make sure you understand what most of these mean. Some of them, like lumen maintenance, uh, have to do with the technology. An incandescent lamp, as it would burn out, would kind of shift to the red. Uh, so that's something which, you know, we really don't see in LEDs. But others, uh, dimmability, kind of the initial cost and the operating cost, and then the efficacy, those are all things we can use to calculate if lighting is, is going to save us any money. The upshot of this whole thing is that natural light really is, is the best. Um, it's in, in many ways, it has huge health advantages, but it is hard to control. Artificial lights uh, come in many different kinds of qualities, so you can have some really fun in your design, uh, in particular because you can control electric lighting so much better. You can light objects, you can create lighting effects. LED light sources are probably going to replace most other types in, in, in your lifetime, you're, you're probably not going to be specifying a lot of incandescent lamps unless you're working on historic projects. And with LEDs, there comes the opportunity to forget about the bulb, go beyond the bulb, um, because basically the LED emitters are going to be integral with the luminaires. And we've already seen that happen with a lot of really dramatic and interesting looking decorative light fixtures.